And of course, that sort of leads us into the idea of NGS and you know uh, when we should be doing NGS and what patient. Uh, Tiffany, do you do NGS on all of your triple negative patients in the metastatic setting? So, uh, you know, I do in the early line setting. So first line metastatic triple negative breast cancer and, and actually at our institution, any subtype, first line metastatic breast cancer, we do next gen sequencing and, and in triple negative breast cancer, I'm sorry to say that we don't often find actionable alterations, but you know, I, I think that with the potential to uncover um, germline CRCA mutations in certain settings, if you're utilizing a test that would be reporting both somatic and germline, that can be important for finding a role for PARP inhibitors. There are trials currently accruing looking at somatic alterations that are non-BRCA that could potentially um, be predictive of benefit to a PARP inhibitor. So I think we're looking for potential mutations to understand the driving biology of that subtype of TNBC. Although rare NTREC mutations are possible, and so this could also be a role for next-gen sequencing notch alterations where there are trials looking at gamma secretase inhibitors are out there and accruing, and certainly to look at AKT, PI3 kinase, and other pathways that could be important in, that, in the heterogeneity of triple negative breast cancer to really choose um, particular trials at this point. Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, you know, when we're thinking about NGS, um, you know, it's of course a critical step to do the easy things first. You know, we should be doing genetic testing for everybody who has uh, certainly triple negative disease. And I think there's a big call to do it for HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer in general. Uh, but uh, the, I think that that's um, a, uh, you know, really, really important thing for everybody to keep in mind. You hate to see a patient who hasn't been tested, who should be. Uh, we tend not to, but because almost everybody's been tested now. Um, you know, we're, when we're thinking about next uh, generation sequencing and personalized medicine and the impact on care, I mean, there's so many issues to talk about here. You know, a drug approved with a companion diagnostic, should it cost more? Does that warrant a higher price? And um, how do we, how do the payers make sure that you are using the appropriate companion diagnostic? Do they, are they the adjudicators of who gets drug or who doesn't based on which companion diagnostic, you know, can, can, um, Joe Smith make a similar companion diagnostic and still have it work because it's half the price? How does that uh, work? Yeah. John. Well, uh, it's interesting. If you go way back um, to the, the first molecular diagnostic, other than her two new or her testing, um, it was um, uh, an ALK uh, mutation in patients who were potentially eligible for chrysotinib and non small cell lung cancer. And Abbott came out with a test that cost $1,500. And Lab said, well, we can do that same mutation analysis uh, for half that amount or even less. And I think there's this mythology, uh, at least amongst payers, that all uh, molecular diagnostics are created equal. And I think uh, we've shown in uh, PDL1 testing that that's not true, and especially in this, uh, in this setting, in the impassion trial where SP142 uh, produced different results than other lab tests, uh, we have to re-examine that. But I would say today that uh, most payers, when they're looking for uh, evidence to support coverage with a specific molecular diagnostic, they're, they're uh, agnostic to which lab is being used. And I think it's really incumbent upon NCCN and, and uh, investigators like you to help us understand which molecular diagnostic should be used and dispel this myth that they're all created equal. But I would say today that, uh, that, that we're simply looking for the molecular diagnostic. I think the, the, the I want to go back to something that uh, Claudine talked about and uh, or the question you posed about patients who had a germline mutation in BRC1 and 2 and also were PDL1 positive. I absolutely agree <laughs> that today um, uh, that's not in the NCCN guidelines, and the best thing for those patients would be uh, to be in uh, in a clinical trial setting. You know, one of the questions is commonly asked, especially since we're doing uh, NGS testing more routinely, is uh, well, let me comment on one thing first. Um, um, if you look at drugs like um, NTREC, 
uh, or uh, NTRK mutations, uh, for which we now have two drugs. The only way to really find out whether or not somebody's eligible for that is to do next-gen sequencing. But with, with that exception, um, I don't know that there are any other drugs that you would want to look for unless you're interested in entering a patient into a clinical trial. But that's the common uh, frustration that payers have, is that while you may want uh, to get uh, next-gen sequencing done on a patient, what usable information is available outside of uh, uh, potential eligibility for a clinical trial? Uh, still an outstanding question. Uh, payers can't control uh, the drugs that are being used, uh, especially in the Medicare population, but we can control when molecular testing is done. So there is an imperative to demonstrate uh, how you're going to use that information, uh, the clinical utility of that information, how it's going to change the management uh, or the potential management of the patient.